as she said, yes, I'm a Tarrant County Master Gardener and all these other things that I've listed. So I've pretty much been gardening all my life since I was a little bitty kid. I've always been eager to uh, go talk to my plants, look at nature, see what's going on, be a plant whisperer, uh, total gardening geek, if you will, okay? So today I'm going to teach you guys, maybe you've tried gardening in the past and you ended up with one tomato, okay? Uh, maybe you planted some blueberries. You got a green vine. Nothing's going on. There's not a party happening, okay? I'm gonna teach you how to remedy those issues and maybe you can figure out, oh, that's what's wrong, okay? So let's get started. Is your garden surviving or thriving? Does your garden look like the left or the right? Okay, both, okay. We want it to look like the right, okay? That tomato plant versus those on the left, okay, the one on the left, the, the soil is too alkaline, okay? First, who here is a brand new gardener? You're just now learning. Be honest, it's okay. I like newbies, okay, good, 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 good. Clean slate, okay? Who here is kind of in the middle? You garden, but you could still learn some improvement, okay? Who is kind of expert? Like you can come up here and even teach today maybe. Help me out. I bet there are some here. So the one on the right is basically a tomato. We've given it everything that it wants, okay? The vascular system of the tomato, it's able to pull up nitrogen, it's able to pull nutrients from the soil, etc. The one on the left, do you know what's wrong with that one? Does anybody know? Uh, it looks like my garden lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, all, that's kind of on the struggle bus. See the yellow leaves, okay? Not enough nitrogen, chlorosis, okay? Something's wrong, it's not getting what it needs and therefore you're not gonna get many tomatoes, okay? All right, for successful gardening, you have to start with good soil, period. I heard some composters over there, love those ladies. I did a composting class last year and you don't have to make your own compost. You can go out and buy some if you wanna be lazy, okay? <laughs> but I make my own at home. You don't have to, not everybody has the time to do it. But if you do, put all your kitchen scraps outside. Okay, soil map of Texas. Take a look at where we are, okay? On the left over there, I told you, Tarrant County is a mix of cross timbers, Grand Prairie, Texas Black Line Prairie. So see how we're, we're even just us in Dallas-Fort Worth, we're divided. See all the different soil? Okay, so no wonder your aunt that lives in East Texas can grow tomatoes better than you, okay? She's calling you, bragging, ooh, I just made some salsa. <laughs> like, I, I only have two, what's going on? <laughs> or down in South Texas, you know? Our weather is totally different, right? We're not even in the same zone. We're in zone Five. number eight. eight, yes. When I first moved here, when I was a kid, we were in zone 7B. Oh. Now we're in zone 7A. If you want to get really nitty gritty, there's 7A, uh, 7B. But yeah, we're in 7A right now. So you, you can kind of tell where we are. But look, everybody's soil is different. Study this, please. Look at the difference. Healthy soil on the left, unhealthy on the right. Look at the roots. Look at the leaves. Okay, this doesn't just apply to trees. Also your tomato plants, your strawberry plants, your azaleas, your begonias, any plant. If it's showing a deficiency, it's gonna grow like that side on the right, okay? If you give the plant or tree or shrub, veggie, what it wants, it'll look like the left. In Tarrant County, we have pretty much two soils. We've got clay, like on the left. Who has clay? Okay, you can dig a hole and there's like a, a little swimming pool, right? Water wants to stay there, it collects, and eventually it will, uh, uh, what do you call it? Go into the soil. If you're lucky, you have sandy loam. That's what plants want, kind of a mix of all the good things. Does anybody have sandy loam? Not many, yeah. You're lucky if you do. I have what's on the left. I have caliche, clay. You can pretty much, when it's wet, 
make a vase. It's, it's horrible. Plants hate our soil. You know, sometimes I ask God, why'd you put me here? I'm a gardener. Why in North Texas? But you know what? I love it here. Don't get me wrong. Okay, study this, please. Especially look at sand versus clay. Sand almost looks like a little boulder, right, compared to the clay. That's why clay gets, gets compacted when you add water. That's why you can make a little base out of it. It's, they're tiny, tiny, like dust particles. And look at sand. So sand, if you have sandy soil and you water it, the water just trickles right through. It can't hold any nutrients. It's like little glass shards. But clay is a great holder of nutrients. But what happens if you have clay soil and it rains? Let's say it rains every, you know, all week, and you walk by, it can kind of stink sometimes, right? Because it's stagnant. There's not a lot of aeration. There's not a lot of oxygen in there. So you, you can wind up in some trouble if you just have clay. Amendments, please read this. Okay, the goal is to make roots happy, okay? All of your plants, your trees, it's not, you know, let me give you some steroids so you can be strong. You have to feed your soil. It's all about the soil, okay? If you have bad soil, you're not gonna be successful. You can't just go out to your backyard, dig a hole, put your tomato in there, and go, grow, I wanna make salsa. It'll survive, but remember I showed you that picture, surviving versus thriving? So I'm gonna show you all the secrets, okay? First, I told you about compost. This is how you're going to apply it. Basically put down two to three inches, like a blanket. Go buy it if you want or make it. Put down two to three inches, till it in. That's how you get started. It aerates and loosens the soil and adds nutrients, okay? The other is expanded shale. Who has used expanded shale? I have. Okay, two people, okay? This, very porous. So remember I told you clay is like congested, not a lot of uh, air, not a lot of oxygen. This has tiny little pore spaces, so it allows oxygen to get into your clay soil. Aerates it, makes it more pliable. So if you have dense clay, I say start with this. A Texas A&M professor actually did a side-by-side -side study and it showed that expanded shale, even though he loves compost, expanded shale won. It made it more pliable, more workable. But he said, you know, I still love compost, so use both. So use expanded shale and compost. Best of both worlds. Texas product too. Okay. Yeah, to break it up. Break it up. Make it more workable. So, so, so the roots, roots can move, yes. Okay. Yes. Remember that tree picture I showed you? Yeah. The roots can't really go anywhere. Our clay is just horrible, it's tough. But if we make the roots happy by aerating the soil with expanded shale and compost, roots can move. Then roots can reach more nutrients. And guess what? Roots need oxygen as much as they need uh, water. Roots need oxygen. The number one reason we kill potted plants is because we overwater. That's the number one reason. Yes. Let me answer one more question. Yes. You lay down a layer of the expanded shell and then compost on top of it? Oh yeah, you can do that. Mm -hmm. that work both of them in, yes. How yeah, you will have- You work them together or two mm -hmm. layers? Um, go ahead and cut two to three inches of both okay. and just work it in. Work mm -hmm. them together? Yes. Oh. Mix it all in Mix together, it. yes. So I gave you guys, I think everybody here can take a bag home. We're gonna give you um, some bags when you leave. They're for Texas A&M. Will you show them what those look like, yeah. Cindy? Yeah, everybody okay. can get one of these. You don't have to have a bag, but there's some instructions on it. You do have to pay $12, but guess what? $12 for a successful yard is nothing in my book. And they will tell you, so you shovel a little bit, you mail it in with your little form. Uh, this is the website soiltesting.tamu.edu. Tamu means Texas A&M University. 
So you send in your sample, they will tell you what your NPK is. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, I'll talk about all that later. But you have to know what your baseline is to know what's wrong. So you guys that have your gardens and you're wondering, why aren't my azaleas working out? Why can't my tomatoes grow? You gotta quit crying about it and get a soil test. When you go to the doctor and you say, I keep vomiting, my back hurts, I keep getting these headaches. Does your doctor say, let me give you a prescription? What does she first say to you? Let's do a blood test, x-rays. Let's find out what's going on, okay? I can't look at my soil and say, you look like you need some magnesium. You, you look like you need some nitrogen. No, you cannot tell. Sometimes your plants will tell you, okay? So you have to start with a soil test, $12. Just do the cheap test. I don't get any money for it, <laughs> it's 12 bucks. And they will tell you what you need to do to remedy the situation. They'll say, apply this much nitrogen, apply this, or don't apply such and such. Can it be different, different parts of your yard though? It can be. I only do one test to get a ba baseline of my native soil. Now, if you have a veggie garden, a raised veggie garden, you might want to get that tested separately to see what's going on with that soil. All right, let's talk about this. NPK, okay? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Who's familiar with those three numbers? Okay, all right, good, good, good. Okay, getting a feel for my audience here. All right, synthetic fertilizers. The NPK numbers, see right there on the left, it says 10, 10, 10. That's called a balanced fertilizer because it's the same number. It could be 555, 20, 20, 20. So when we say balanced, that's what we mean. It's just the same. The first number is for leafy top growth. What, what has leafy top growth? Grass, Grass lettuce. lettuce, spinach. So you get the idea, okay? We don't expect flowers out of spinach, right? We don't expect flowers out of our grass. We don't, want, we don't want them to seed, but you get what I'm saying. Phosphorus is for roots and flowers, but think roots down. Potassium is for all around wellness. Now, let me tell you the difference between organic and synthetic. NPK is really only meant for synthetic. It's not a fair basis for organic because by law, the government requires manufacturers to list on the bag what's immediately available, meaning they have put in 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. That's what that means in that bag. The rest is filler, okay? It doesn't mean you're getting gypped because it's a low number. So what that means is 10%, let's say that's a 50 pound bag. So 10% by weight of 50 pounds is Okay, so you do the math on that and it'll tell you how many pounds of each they actually put into that bag. The rest is filler to keep it from coagulating and things like that. Uh, with organic, it's not like that because it's crushed up seaweed or maybe um, uh, chicken poop that they ground up for you. So see what I'm saying? That's actually a product that is natural and organic that you're going to use whereas synthetic fertilizers have these different numbers. So an organic fertilizer might say 1-5-2. It doesn't mean you're getting a lower quality product. It's just a different animal. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is really only for synthetic, okay? But organic fertilizers still have to put that on there and it's really not fair. So I'm glad we're over that stuff. So here's another graphic. Nitrogen, think up, okay? Phosphorus, think down, the roots. Potassium, all around. Now you'll remember. Here's my soil test. The soil test I'm telling you to do, I had to blur out my address so you guys don't um, stalk my veggie garden. <laughs> so take a look, see that? 
yellow number? Yep. Or the, the this right here? So this is where I should be, okay? But see how nit this is nitrate nitrogen? I'm deficient. No big deal, that's normal. Nitrogen is depleted quickly. That's why in the summertime, we apply nitrogen to our grass to green it up, okay? Because it's depleted. Phosphorus, not bad, but I'm a little short, okay? It could be right here. Potassium, remember I said N, P, K, okay? Do I need to add any more of the K, the potassium? No. Then why are you guys doing it? Why are you going out there getting fertilizer and throwing it out? Okay? You need to know your baseline. You need to know where you're at. I had a student get a soil test back, and she said, Loretta, my phosphorus was off the chart. And I said, well, what did Texas a and tell you to do? They told me not to apply phosphorus for five years. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, what have you been doing? I don't know. I bought the house that way. So... She had been applying miracle Grow on this, lawn fertilizer on that. She had so many issues because your plants need to have, you know, a balance. It needs enough nitrogen, it needs enough phosphorus to get the vascular system working well. If you have too much calcium in your body, something might go wrong, okay? If your red blood cells are way off the chart, something's wrong, same thing. Look at this like a blood test. Okay, so please go out and spin your toolbox, find out where you're at, so you can get a baseline of where you are. Make sense? So now let's go back to this organic fertilizer deal. And I'm not telling you go organic. I prefer it just after years of research and uh, working in my garden for 30 years. But take a look, synthetic fertilizers go straight to the plant. Okay, kind of like if a guy or girl wants to work out and pump up their muscles, they'll take steroids, okay? It makes their muscles huge. That's what synthetic fertilizers do. Look at what organic fertilizers do. It feeds the soil. Remember I told you, soil is what makes, good soil makes roots happy, happy plants, more cucumbers for pickles, more tomatoes for salsa and marinara. You have to have good soil, okay? And look at the microorganisms on the left, okay? You know our gut biome, good bacteria in our gut? Plants are the same way. They need the good uh, microbiome in the soil. So use what you want. I'm not telling you to go organic or synthetic, but I wanted you to be aware of this. Here are my favorite types of fertilizers. Note the low NPK, 511. 624. It's a different animal. Okay, it's not synthetic. This is actually crushed up fish, crushed up seaweed. And it feeds my soil, good bacteria. It nurtures the soil, the microbiome, makes the roots happy. There is a partnership with good fungi in the soil and the roots. They almost kind of talk to each other and say, hey, thanks. Thanks for helping me out and letting me absorb more nutrients out of soil. There, there's a little relationship there. Okay, so I'm not saying go out and buy these brands, okay? I showed you different brands so that you'll be more aware of what's out there and why the numbers on these are so low. It's not apples to apples, synthetic and organic. I really wish they would give us a different rating system for organic so that we're not looking at this like, ah, that's only 511, that's like water. No, it's not. I've had great results. Um, I like to use this MicroLife Super Seaweed and the fish fertilizer, but it stinks to high heaven. <laughs> I have to shower after I apply it because I feel like it's on me. Um, if you have dogs, don't use the fish fertilizer, they will dig. So I started using more of the Super Seaweed, but I'm telling you, things grow like crazy. I put it on my trees, my veggie gardens, everything. Question? Yes. If you, if you do the test with the agriculture, mm -hmm. it says you need potassium. Yes. And you would, you would still use those numbers on the organic? Yes. Yeah, because I use compost now on my lawn, it would be different. I know that I'm deficient in nitrogen, so I'll apply some nitrogen if I want it to green up. 
But as far as my veggies and things like that, I, I go the organic route. It doesn't matter those numbers? No, it's because it's, it's feeding the soil. Organic fertilizer is gentle. It doesn't burn as long as you use it according to the instructions. So it's just, it goes in there and just works with nature. It just works better. Oh. Now synthetic is, is different. So but like I said, it's up to you guys. Synthetic is like steroids. Like yes, it's, it's just normal. instant. It's just instant. It goes, yeah, it goes right into the plant. The plant does, you know, you're forcing the plant to grow and do what it wants to do. Me personally, I like to go organic for my veggies and my herbs because I'm going to eat those. But it's up to you. I'm not telling you which way to go. So, soil fertility determines your expected yields. If you have weak soil, you're going to have a weak yield. You're, you're going to have two cucumbers. Okay. I don't want you guys to turn into that. I don't want you to say gardening's not for me. You will get this if you give your soil what it what it needs then your roots will get what it needs. Then your plant will grow accordingly. Okay, let's take a look at this pH chart. Okay, seven is neutral, right in the middle. Did you ever think you had to think about the pH scale for your veggie garden? You know, even us as humans, we have a pH. They can check your blood your urine and check your pH. We're a lot like plants, I, I know, it's hard to believe. But take a look at the numbers. Acidic, lower numbers. Alkaline, higher numbers. Seven is neutral, like water. Now take a look at this to kind of get an idea of where, what different things are. Okay. Most plants like it in the six range, most. Do you remember what my pH is on my soil test? No. 7.8. 7.8, yes, good job. 7.8, that's moderately alkaline. Plants hate that, they hate it. So no wonder if I just dig a hole and put a plant in there, it'll survive, but it's not like I'm gonna brag to my neighbor, come check this out. There's nothing to brag about. Unless I amend and give my soil what it needs so my plant can grab what it needs. So let's see how this comes into play. Yes? I've heard that uh, coffee grounds are really good for the soil. Excellent, yes. Worms love coffee grounds. I put it in my compost. I'll even just sprinkle it on some plants. Yes. Okay, I better hold questions to the end. I wanna make sure you guys get all this information. I love questions, by the way, but I just wanna make sure you guys have enough information to become successful at gardening. So let's let's take a look and see why we need to pay attention to soil uh, pH. Who has azaleas? Okay. You know, azaleas, they're beautiful, but they're not from here. They're not native. So because of, you know, like Japanese maples, uh, azaleas, some hydrangeas, so we have to treat those differently. We have to go out and buy acidic fertilizer for hollies acidic fertilizer for azaleas. Look at azaleas, they like acidic soil, five to 5.5. Remember my soil is 7.8. So when I plant azaleas in my yard, they look horrible. The leaves turn yellow, it's too alkaline. Are you guys getting this now, the acidic uh, alkaline? Let's keep going. Blueberries, super acidic, 4.3 to 5.5. No wonder, okay, one of my neighbors, she has a plant, one of everything in her yard, one of everything. And she get, she said, Loretta, I planted my blueberries and put them up on a little fence, a DIY, DIY thing I did. She's like, but I don't have any blueberries and the leaves don't look so good. Yeah, you need to apply some sulfur that brings down the pH. Vegetables, most ornamentals, six to 6.8. We're getting a little closer, okay? Getting a little closer to my pH. Clematises, we're getting even closer, six to seven. Clematises do very well here. You can just give them a little compost. You can even just dig a hole, put them in there, they'll be okay. Salvias, look at that. No wonder salvia gregii, which is a native here, I never fertilize those things. They are 
just covered in a sea of pink and red. All my salvias. I never fertilize them. I don't have to because guess what? They like our native soil because they're from here. Okay? So that's why when a plant's not from here, it's not native, you have to give it a little more tender care, a little more water, a little more of this, a little more of that, high maintenance. So that's why I only get native plants. And I don't have a yard full of cacti. I actually have flowing grasses, uh, my live oaks, my magnolias. Uh, and you can get adapted plants too. They don't just have to be native. So anything that likes our pH, you're gonna have more success with. Is everybody clear on that before I move on? Yes. Oh yes, it can, mm -hmm. it can. All plants. Uh, plants have, you know, the xylem and the phloem. It's the vascular system, kind of like our veins. So if something goes awry or you have too much of one thing, too much phosphorus, not enough, uh, or if it's too alkaline, things stop. It, it, can't, it can't conduct photosynthesis like it's supposed to, and things just go haywire. You get the yellow leaves, you get issues. So we want to pay attention to pH. A lot of people, they just think, oh, if I fertilize, it'll be fine, but they're not paying attention to this very critical component. I'm gonna answer questions at the very end now. We've gotta get through this or I'll keep you till midnight. Okay, I just talked about that. What happens when soil pH isn't right for the plant? Problems. No fruit, no veggies. You cannot change your yard's pH unless you're a billionaire and someone scrapes all the soil off and then comes in trucks, you know, 20, 30 truckloads but it's eventually gonna go back to our natural pH again. You cannot change. You can amend, you can, you can top dress, add some more compost to new, you know, bring it more into a, a neutral area or a little more acidic, but you cannot change. That's why choose native plants. They're meant to be here. And choose recommended varieties. I'm gonna teach you guys which Texas A&M website to go to you type in, uh, you just, it's a drop down. You select our region, which is region B, and it will t they will tell you which tomatoes to go buy, which cucumbers to buy. So you print that four to five page list, okay? Go to Home Depot, Lowe's, Callaway's, wherever you like to go, buy those. Because Texas A&M has actually done the research for us and told us this is what grows well here with our drought, with our soil pH. Yes, you still need to give it some tender, loving care, compost, water it. You can't just plant it and forget it. But, you know, who's tired of wasting money on plants that die? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Me too. So, when I go shopping for veggies, I can't remember all the varieties. I remember Juliet tomatoes are great for here. Celebrities are always fantastic. But I forget the other one, so I always refer to that too. And I'll show you where to go. Coming up. Location, location, location. Everybody knows your veggie garden needs a lot of sun. Some say six plus, eight plus is good. If you have a tree nearby and it's shading it, that's not sun. Quit kidding yourself. You have to have full sun. Southern exposure. Close to a water source, because you have to water your veggie garden. By the way, what's wrong with this picture on the left? It's really pretty and all, but what's wrong with that design? How are you going to pick the ones in the middle? Right? Long arms. <laughs> Long arms, yeah. That's the problem. You're going to trample your soil and cause compaction. You don't want to do that. So what I recommend in a garden like that is put some stepping stones where you will always walk, because who cares about compacting it underneath the stones? That's fine, you're gonna walk on it. So you can reach. You need to make a decision. Do you want it in your ground? Do you want it raised? I tell people, especially beginners, if you don't mind a little bit of cost, creating a raised bed, because you can put your good soil in there. You don't have to worry with this nasty stuff that we have, but you can do in ground if you want. Soil test. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we're gonna talk about in-ground vegetable gardens, okay? Uh, if you have Bermuda, does anybody have Bermuda? Only a few people? Okay. Uh, Bermuda is, I call it the devil, because it wants to get into flower beds. No matter what you do, you see a little patch come up, you, you gotta get it quickly or then you'll have a lawn. It's horrible. I like St. Augustine, but it's got its issues too. So you do have to have some barrier. You can't just, you know, dig it up. Have you guys heard of sheet mulching or lasagna gardening? Okay, that's what I do. In my half acre yard, I have, ba I have Bermuda. You cannot dig that up. You really can't. Professional landscapers will actually go and douse glyphosate or Roundup. They'll douse that area to make you a flower bed and then they'll come a week later or so and dig it up. That's the only way to ensure that those roots die. Because if you dig up, let's say six inches of soil to create your flower bed, if you leave one little hair root, you've got more Bermuda coming up. That's why I hate Bermuda, but that's what I have. So look up Google sheet mulching or lasagna gardening. That's how I created all of my flower beds. You use cardboard to suffocate it, many layers and then mulch. I teach a class on that. Okay, so remove grass and weeds, till down to 12 inches, break up your soil. This is of course an in-ground veggie garden, okay? But if you've got Bermuda, don't send me hate mail because if you do this, you're gonna have another Bermuda lawn before long. It's, it's horrible. Remove as many rocks as you can. Add amendments, but of course, soil test needed. Because how will you know? You might have perfect soil as is, minus the rocks if you add some compost and expanded shale. You might have perfect NPK numbers, but you don't know. You can't talk to your soil. Here are some raised bed gardens. I like these, they're easier on your back. You don't have to bend over depending on how tall they are. Um, for the most part, weeds are not a problem, but I definitely would not put one in the middle of your lawn unless you put down some weed barrier first because the grass can shoo, come right up. Or put, see how they have like walking areas with no lawn? That is the best way because lawn will go in there because you've got good soil and that's where the roots want to go. So don't be surprised if you see some grass blades coming up. Here are the benefits of a raised bed garden. By the way, people always ask me, where do I buy my soil for this raised bed? You can go to Living Earth or WizQ Stone or my favorite place right now is Silver Creek Nursery. Silver Creek, I'm sorry, Silver Creek Materials. They actually recycle zoo poo, herbivore poo poo. They actually make compost out of it and then soil. Very rich, really good results. So now I don't get paid by them either, but I'm just saying that's a really good uh, source for you. But Wiz Keystone also has it, Living Earth, any of those. There are more, but that's what I remember right now. And here are the disadvantages. It can be very expensive, I'm not gonna lie. It's an investment, it's a hobby, okay? It's a labor of love. If you need to know how much soil to get, go to soilcalculator.com and you can type in round flower or round veggie garden or rectangular, how deep is it, how wide, the width, and it'll tell you how many backs to get or how many cubic feet to get. You'll know exactly what. And then you can call the vendor and say, how much is it per cubic foot? They'll tell you, then you can start budgeting. And then you can also budget, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and budget your cedar for the edging or go buy one of those aluminum ones that you put together, whatever you wanna do. But you, you need a budget because you might end up spending $1,000 on your three by five yeah. veggie garden. Okay, so that $2 tomato at Walmart is looking better and better, right? But um, <laughs> I'm not telling you not to do it, but I don't want you to hate me and send uh, sent her a hate mail. Oh, Loretta, made me do this. Spent a thousand dollars. I'm just being real. If you have a raised bed, you will have some limited space because you've got to only work in that little area. Whereas if it's in the ground, you can easily, if you have a big yard, make it bigger. It does dry out faster because it's kind of a container. Always, if you have a 
raised bed, overfill it because after some rains and watering, it will settle like crazy. So mound it up. It'll probably settle a good six inches. So make sure you put more than you think. Container gardening. Um, a lot of my students, they live in condos and stuff. So I tell them, yeah, that's fine. But make sure you get varieties that are container friendly. Okay, you don't want to get plants or, that are going to, um, uh, I'll talk to you later about types of tomatoes, indeterminate, determinate. But um, yeah, remember those black pots, they get really, really hot. Okay, so you may not want to get those. Bigger the pot, the less watering for you because you have more volume. Easy access. Okay, this one's kind of a fancy garden. I love this, but you do need to have access. You don't want to have a veggie garden that's about as big as this area here and not have any place to walk. You have to put some stepping stones or something so that you know where to walk. Okay, can you reach your veggies without tearing anything else up? They've got some netting up on the left side to keep rabbits and things like that out. So you can make it as fancy as you want. You need to mulch in North Texas, two to three inches. By the way, on your trees, don't put more than two inches. The roots need oxygen too, so only two inches. And we don't wanna do volcanoes on trees. Okay, move that mulch away from your tree bark. Mulch should never touch your tree bark. I will repeat that again, um, move it away. We need to have donuts around trees, not volcanoes. Okay, I know this is a tree class, but I love trees. I have done this. I want to set you guys up for success, okay? I have done this. I actually put a raised flower bed right on top of sprinkler systems because I got excited. My husband and I went out, let's put it right here. We built it. And then when I turned on the sprinkler system later on, we're like, we heard, you know, but we didn't see the water. Sure enough, I put it right on top. So we had to dig and then I had to go hire a plumber. It was more to the cost of my already expensive uh, veggie bed. Call 811 before you dig. It's free. They come out within days. They'll mark it and tell you where not to dig. Because what if you put, what if you start digging around and there's a bunch of city wires under there or, or, or plumbing? More cost for you to deal with. So call 811, absolutely free. Raised bed soil, I already told you where to buy it. A lot of times if you call these vendors and say, do you have vegetable soil? They will have it already mixed up for you. Veggie garden soil. Anytime I'm gardening in my front or backyard, in my flower bed, if I see a worm, I'll pick it up and stick it in my veggie garden because they leave behind worm poo, worm compost, and they aerate constantly. Where you see worms, that's good soil. Don't be afraid of them. Told you about that earlier. Does anybody have a huge garden where they're gonna do rows? Probably not, so I'm gonna skip this one. <laughs> drip irrigation is recommended because especially tomatoes because tomatoes can get blight fungal issues tomatoes do not want to be watered from on top with a hose never ever get their leaves wet if you want to avoid issues always water from the bottom okay so that's why these these uh, drip irrigation hoses are the best similar setup to this and mine's on a timer. Yes? Are many other vegetables, uh, you don't want to get the leaves wet, you want to water from the top? Yes, water, water from the bottom. On yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do not want their tops wet. Water from the bottom. Drip irrigation is the number one way to water your veggie garden. Some won't get disease and all that, they're less finicky, but tomatoes especially, never water from on top. Seedlings, if you're starting from seed, I just taught that class, um, how to start plants from seeds. They need more tender, loving care at the beginning, okay? So make sure if you, if you grow them inside, you acclimate them to the sun. 
bring them out for a couple minutes the first day, take them back in. The next day, maybe five minutes. The next day, I told you it's work, okay? So you might wanna just go, I say to new gardeners, just go up to Home Depot, Lowe's, Cali's, buy a little veggie plant, start there. Don't try to start from seeds because you can also have fungal issues. You could have uh, no germination. All kinds of things can happen. So do that maybe year two after you started your first successful veggie garden. Indeterminate versus determinate tomatoes. I get asked this question a lot because people want to plant tomatoes, okay? Look at the difference. Study this graphic here. Indeterminate on the left, determinate on the right. Two different types of tomatoes, way different. So on the left, if you want tomatoes on your salad throughout the whole growing season, get indeterminate. Okay, because it's not going to have a whole lot of tomatoes at once, but you're always going to have tomatoes for dinner. The one on the right is a bush tomato. Determinate. They are determined. They will give you tomatoes for about a month or less, and then it dwindles away. So a lot of students will come to me and say, my tomato did so well for me, and then no more tomatoes. What did I do? Is your NPK okay? Oh yeah, everything's fine. Well, what kind of tomato did you get? I don't know. I always tell my students, keep your label. Pay attention to your label. Every plant I've ever bought is in a little plastic pen holder. I keep all my labels because I want to go back and look at them. And pay attention when you go looking for your tomato seeds or tomato plants, look to see, does it say indeterminate or determinate? If you want to can and make salsa, which one should you get? Bush, bush, because you're going to get all your tomatoes at once. You're gonna get more of a quantity. It's one and done. The indeterminate, you're gonna have three tomatoes here this week. You know, you could have more. If your soil is like awesome, you might have 12 tomatoes. Next week, 10 tomatoes. But the bush is gonna give you bam, all at once. And they're typically smaller. You can even put those in pots. Here's just a listing of what I just told you. See the difference? So don't just look at the picture, oh, cherry tomatoes, oh, this. You need to look to see, does this fit your needs? Is this what you want your tomatoes for? And look, I underlined prune under indeterminate. Indeterminate tomatoes, tomato vines get huge. You'll need a fence or something to support them. 10 feet, they can get huge. I've heard of even 20 feet, but you need to prune those. You have to prune those. Why? Well, that root, those roots are supplying all the energy, right? And also photosynthesis from the leaves. Well, you don't want your plant to just focus on growing leaves, the green. Do you grow tomatoes for the leaves? No, you want fruit. So to force it to fruit more, you need to cut off the lower leaves because those are just taking up energy. Your roots are sending energy to keep those green leaves going. Cut those bottom ones off. Also trim some of the green leaves on the plant itself, not all. It still needs to conduct photosynthesis and create sugars to feed the plant. So what I suggest is get on YouTube and type in how to prune tomato plants. You also need to take off all the suckers. The suckers are, here's the stem and here's, okay, here's the stem, the main stem and then a little branch, little, another little stem. If you have a little sucker in the middle, you need to pick that off because suckers are just sucking energy from the tomato plant. Do you want suckers or do you want tomatoes? I want more tomatoes, so take those suckers off. Determinant, you don't need to. Remember, one and done. You're not gonna have that tomato plant for months and months and months. It pretty much will give you, some give you a bunch of tomatoes and then start to slowly die. By the way, in Texas here, North Texas, we have two gardening seasons. We have spring and fall. Summertime, go on vacation. Forget about your veggie garden. Mm -hmm. You might have to put a shade cloth over it, you know, whatnot, but tomatoes are pretty much gonna be like, I did what I'm supposed to do, see you later. But you have fall. Oh, by the way, oh, we'll talk about that later. The veggie planting calendar, so you know when to plant what. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what it's going to look like. Your determinant is going to be full of tomatoes. You're going to be so proud. Look what happened, all these tomatoes. And then it's going to say bye. But the indeterminate, not as many tomatoes, but it will keep producing for three months or more. Now you know how to shop for your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Some examples of what to look for. Determinate. Can you see uh, the sweetie ones? Is it indeterminate or determinate? The one in the middle. Indeterminate. indeterminate type. It's no secret. They will tell you. Just look at the label. The one on the right, determinate or indeterminate? Determinate. Determinate, yes. So now you know. Buy the right tomato. Fertilizing tomatoes. Fertilize at planting time. When you dig that hole in your good soil, fertilize. Put your plant in. Plant your tomatoes deep. Okay? Not where the soil line is, but plant them deep. Fertilize again only, only, only after your first set of fruits are formed. If you fertilize too early, you're just looking at the back of the package, fertilize every other week or every week, that tomato will turn into a tree. You're gonna be feeding the leaves. So don't fertilize too soon. Wait till you see those little fruits. Then it tells you, okay, now it's time to start fertilizing. Who has put regular miracle Grow on your tomatoes? Yeah, all, of <laughs> all of us, he said, all of us. <laughs> You ended up with a tomato tree, right? No tomatoes, okay? Remember I talked about N, P, K? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium? Regular miracle Grow has too much nitrogen. Never ever put regular miracle Grow on tomatoes. Never. You will end up with tomato trees and absolutely no fruit because the nitrogen goes in there and the, the tomato says, ooh, I'm gonna grow all these green leaves. Nitrogen, remember? Up. If you like Miracle Girl, that's fine. I have, you know, I don't know. <laughs> now, if you are, okay, I'll, okay, he's saying I'm bashing Miracle Girl too much. If you love Miracle Girl and you want to use it on your tomatoes, get Miracle Girl for tomatoes only for your tomatoes. Use that. But I like fish fertilizer and seaweed. It's up to you, whatever you want to eat. Write this down. This is where you're going to find your shopping list. You can just Google AgriLife Extension and it'll come up. It's our website, Texas A&M. This is where all that research is, where you'll find out what cantaloupes to buy, what cucumbers to buy, which, which peppers to buy, and I'll show you what it looks like. You don't have to type in all that. Just type in AgriLife Extension and it'll come up. It's all free information too. Got it? Somebody was asking me before we started about shade, you know, we don't have a lot of sun. Well, these will, to will tolerate partial shade. Not all veggies have to have that super bright sunlight. So if you're lucky enough to have some shade, there are your options there. And look, I got it off of AgriLife Extension's website, the website I just gave you. You can find all this information on that website. Okay, if you're gonna go on a cruise in two months, you may not want to get slow harvesting plants, ones that take 80 days or more. You might want to just do the quick ones, 30 to 60 days, you know? If you still have to get your gardening kit, get, get those plants on top. Google vegetable variety selector. It's also on the Texas a uh, Extension website but this is what that list I was telling you about is going to look like. And this is just one page of many. Uh, see, it says cucumber. I actually just bought Sumter seeds. See, it's under pickling, because I'm going to make pickles. I love Korean style pickles. So I'm going to make some, and that's a good pickling cucumber. I would not buy any other one. Why? Why waste your time? What if it you know, succumbs to disease or too many bugs because it, it doesn't tolerate our heat. All of these have been tested by Texas A&M in their little gardening field. They're like, oh, that did well, this did well, this did well, put it on the list. This is the approved list. So don't waste your money on these unknown ones. You might have luck. And maybe it wasn't, that variety wasn't tested by Texas A&M. But if you stick with this, you'll do well. 
we are going to give you a vegetable calendar. Texas A&M has one on the left. What you can do to find these, um, I think the one on the right is the one that we're going to give you. It tells you exactly when to plant tomatoes, when to plant leeks, onions, because you can't just plant everything at the same time. Asian greens like cool weather. Okay, cilantro. When does that need to be planted? Cool weather. Cilantro in the summer doesn't grow. If you, if your cilantro dies in the summer, it's not you. It's cilantro. So. We will give you that. If you want the veggie calendar on the left, that's the one that my students really like, but honestly, it does come out kind of blurry, but go to Google and just type in uh, vegetable garden planting guide, and you will see that within 100 different calendars. But remember how I told you our zone and our temperature here is different than Galveston, than Kentucky, Indiana? Make sure this is for North Texas or Zone 8, okay? Make sure. The print on that you can't see, but it does on the left say Collin County on the left one. They're in Zone 8 like us, so you can use that calendar. Uh, the one in the middle is Marshall Grain. That's a great one. And this one specifically, it says for Dallas, Fort Worth, and North Texas. So you know you can use this one and um, trust those dates. Companion plants, okay? Take a look at these a little bit. Your plants may be enemies. Did you know that plants could be enemies? Okay, I told you, plants are a lot like us, okay? Anything with a red dot means never plant them side by side. Plant them apart, because they hate each other. Look, examples, tomatoes love basil. Even in food, they go well together. Beans don't like garlic and onions. Dill likes cauliflower but hates carrots. Sounds like a soap opera. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, he says, sounds like his family or a family. Yes, so Cindy was gracious enough. She printed this for you guys too. So you're gonna get this before you leave. So now you've got, you know about soil pH. You will know when to plant what so you don't go out and buy something goofy at the wrong time. You won't go out and get cilantro in the middle of summer, for instance. So you know the timing, you know what kind of soil you need, and what not to plant next to each other. You'll get that, so don't worry. I saw somebody taking a picture. Vining plants need a lot of room, a lot of room. I've done square foot gardening. Has anybody tried square foot gardening? Okay, it's fun. Um, but you do have to be careful with these vines. Pumpkins, cucumbers, they will shade and take over your entire garden. They'll climb over your tomatoes. Tomatoes want sun, so they don't want this happening. So you might have to create a little trellis or something for it to grow on. Make sure you plant your tall things in the back, short in the front, okay? You don't wanna put corn in front of your herbs, right? Because mm -hmm. the herbs will get shaded. So you gotta kind of think. I like to sketch out my garden. I change it up every year. You know, there's something called crop rotation. Um, it's not so much for us small time gardeners, but I do keep that in mind because you want to avoid nematodes and any other issues that might happen. So one year I'll put tomatoes on this side and then the next year I'll put tomatoes on the other side of my garden. So mix it up. Also, Cucumbers, melons, a lot of those plants are very thirsty. They need a lot of water. So plant those together. Tomatoes don't need as much. Your herbs don't need as much. So put those on that other side so you have similar watering needs. Has anybody had tomato blossom end rot? Yes, very devastating. Everything goes well all year, you're excited, and then it's rotten on the end. You don't want to eat it. It's usually because of insufficient calcium in your soil. But if you get a soil test, you'll know. Also, it could be from incorrect watering or it could be a, a, a mix of all those things. So what I like to do is crush up a calcium pill with every tomato plant and you'll ensure, at least minimize the chance of getting this if you have uh, insufficient calcium. But go get that soil test so you can prevent this from happening. Has anybody seen these issues? How are we doing on time? 
Okay. Aphids, yes, they suck the life out of your plants. They, they make them dry, they crumble up. Aphids and bugs, they know when your plant's under distress. And it's usually because you're not watering correctly, or maybe the, the nutrition's a little off. That plant is stressed, and bugs can sense that, so they come and attack. So if you have a healthy plant, you're less likely to have bugs come to you. By the way, only 5% of bugs are harmful to your plants, only 5%. So quit throwing out all that seven dust and everything else. So it's because you're hurting the 95% of bugs that we need, like um, ladybugs, um, praying mantises, beneficial, you know, this and that. Protect those because they're eating the bad guys, the, the spiders, protect all of those. Absolutely. On the left, has anybody seen that happen to like a cucumber plant? Everything looks good and then all of a sudden, you know, it's a little baby green cucumber, but then one day you come home and it turned yellow or it falls off. You've never seen that? Yeah. Okay. If you have, it's because that flower did not get fertilized. A bee, a wasp, a moth, an ant didn't come and cross-pollinate it. That's why it ends up going, okay, I wasn't pollinated, I'm dying, and it falls off. So you need to bring in some more um, flowering, bee-loving plants. Plant them around, or if you've got a lot of spare time, just get a little Q-tip or paintbrush and just <laughs> fertilize. But you have to have a lot of time on your hands, but some people do do that. Tomatoes. Um, well, one thing about cucumbers, the flowers on a cucumber plant are separate. So you have a male flower and a female flower. So something has to come by, pick up that pollen, okay? That has to happen, that exchange has to happen. Whereas a tomato plant has a bisexual or what's also called a perfect flower because it has male and female in that flower. So how does that one get fertilized? How do you create more tomatoes? Yes, you grab the stem and gently shake it. So you can create, you know, wind can help that too. So you don't necessarily need as many bees around tomatoes as you do around cucumbers, melons, and things like that. On those, you have to have those pollinators come in. Is that clear? If you don't know, Google it. Is my plant monoecious? Is it dioecious? Is it does it have bisexual flowers? How does it sexually propagate? Just Google that information. I told you, they're a lot like us. Okay. Attract bees to the garden. Quit using bee-killing chemicals. It sh shocks me that people still do that. They provide food for us. All right, closing notes, and then I'll answer any questions you guys have. Plant what you love, not what you think your neighbor's gonna ask you for. Because if you don't love it, you're not gonna take care of it. You're gonna get tired of taking care of it. If you like cucumbers, plant cucumbers. If you want tomatoes, plant tomatoes. You know where to get your shopping list now. Just remember, vegetable variety selector. Maybe I can even show you what it looks like before you guys leave. I'll go through this really quick. Oh, by the way, when you plant native plants, they don't need fertilizer. Remember I told you that salvia gregia that I have, my magnolias, my live oaks, they never need fertilizer because they get what they need out of our native soil. They're from here. But vegetables, they need fertilizer. Do you know why? They need some of that fish emulsion or seaweed emulsion or whatever fertilizer you want because it's a one-year plant and you want to force that plant to make you fruit and vegetables, right? So you've got to give it what it needs. You've got to give that extra nutrition. So you do need to fertilize your veggie plants. Okay, I touched, bait, touched on all of these. Read that please, on the bottom, a poor gardener. <laughs> I share that with my students every semester because that is the truth. That is the truth. Okay, any questions? Hopefully veggie gardening related, but it can be um, something else. Any kind of plant, tree, issue? Yes? So 
watering, obviously, you say is very important. Yes. But and you say different vegetables require different watering. Yes. So do you, do you have four different types of vegetables? You're going to have four different watering cycles that you have to do your own. Generally speaking, I mean, you can give this one more water if it's like a melon or cucumber. They're very thirsty. They need a lot of water versus your tomatoes over here. You might want to do two different drip cycles, but for the most part, you can, you're can. you okay with just doing a general deep watering with your drip irrigation. Um, you have to go out and inspect and see what the plant needs. I go out every day, even if I have a automatic drip irrigation, I'll go out there just to make sure I don't see any leaf curling or any brown tips, just to make sure. And if I need to dial it up, I do, or dial it down, but I do. Or I'll, I might even supplement. Veggie gardens, guys, is work. It's another pet. I'm gonna be honest with you, it's another pet to take care of. So you can't just plant it and forget it. So yes, just go out there and inspect. How about misters? Misters are okay. Um, the drip irrigation is going to be a little bit better, but I do use misters too in my drip irrigation. I just got it at Home Depot. It's a little um, container set. It comes with little drip emitters or misters. I do use that on some things, so it just depends on how big the plant is, what it is. Okay, I'm not used to a Mac. How do I get to the website on this? Right there, Google's right in the middle. Chrome, Chrome oh, at the oh, bottom. Yeah, yeah, you can click on that. Oh, sorry guys, I'm not used to a Mac. So let's type in. Okay, vegetable variety selector. You're right here, it comes right up. Just Google that. How do I make this bigger? Uh, you click on that green circle in the top left hand corner. Thank you. All right. Which county do we live in? Okay. You can select by that whatever vegetable you want, or do a list of all. Just do a list of all in case you go to the store and see some things you might want to buy. So right here, you can select tomatoes, beets, whatever you want, or just go here and select all. And there's that list. Easy peasy, look at that. So specific on the tomatoes, you want large, medium, paste. Okay. Vegetable variety selector, free. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, what's your question again? Some of the soil out and then put the uh, no, 
Don't mess with the roots. You can top dress. Okay. So just sprinkle some compost right on top. With rain, uh, slow deep watering, all those nutrients, nutrients will go down. Also, um, do I have like one more minute? Um, with trees, um, that's a great question. Now I'm a big tree person. When you plant a tree, um, you know, you dig your hole three times as wide, not deep. Okay, the bottom should be firm. Don't dig deep because if you dig it too deep and then backfill it, then put your tree in, over time it settles because you've disturbed that soil. You never want to plant trees too deep. At the bottom of a tree, you should always see a tapering. If you go to the forest, you'll see the bottom of a tree that looks like this, like the bottom of a wine glass. You never want to see a tree like this in the soil, like a stop sign pole, never. That's too deep. And a lot of our trees have issues because people and even gardeners, landscape companies are planting them too deep. Um, also, you don't want to disturb the roots once it's already planted. So yeah, just, just top dress. But when you do plant a tree initially, dig your hole and only use native soils. Do not add any other amendments. You do add amendments for veggies, flowers, okay? Never for shrubs and trees because first of all, get a native one if you can or adapted. Um, if you put that tree, you know, you dig a hole, put that tree in, um, I forgot what I was gonna tell you about that. Loosen up the roots. You want your roots to grow like this. You don't want them to mangle the tree over time like this. In a pot, the trees, the roots will be like this. Be rough, rip them up. Let them grow like this. Um, no amendments because you want that tree to grow like this and not go, ooh, compost. I'm gonna stay in this little <laughs> hole and grow my roots like this. I'm not gonna go out. I'm gonna keep growing like this. Then that's why we have a lot of diseased trees now. They're breaking, they're not full on top, too many issues. So never amend. If you don't have enough soil after you plant your tree, you can top it with better soil on top, but never mix it into that hole. 